everybody. How you doing out there? Are you guys ready for the final panel of Spookala? I mean, it's, it's kind of a sad thing, right? Because this has been a great weekend and there's only one more panel left. But you know what? They saved a wicked good panel for the final panel. Am I right? All right. Without further ado, we don't want to take up any more of this man's time with me up here yapping. We want to hear this guy yapping. Let's bring him on up here, Mr. Ron. This is your uh, last panel, of the only panel you guys have been to all weekend, which would be odd if you have. We have a live mic in the front. Ron and I are going to be uh, talking like friends from the old hood or friends from the clubhouse, so it'd be. Uh, but if uh, you guys have a question, come up here to the line, and uh, as soon as we get a chance to get to you, we will. So, Ron, how's your experience been so far at Spook Alley? What do you think about Spook Alley? Well... So you know what? We got a question up here. We're going to go right to the question. What do you? How, who are you? What is your name? And what's your question for Mr. Ron Pearl? Hi, I'm Charlie, and I was wondering what was your favorite role you ever did. Oh, oh my God! I, you know, I, I, uh, I love all my children equally. <laughs> um, but I've been very lucky. I've had a, a lot of roles that I really, really do love, and so much so that I can't even pick one. Thank you. You're welcome. So uh, you've played a lot of bad guys and anti-heroes. Do you see a difference between, say, someone like Hellboy, who's pretty much a good guy that's just in a like sucky role in life, or, and Clay Morrow from Sons of Anarchy, who is really painted to be a, a... The show paints him to be the bad guy. They try to paint him as the bad guy. They, they want him to be seen as the bad guy. Um, you know, my... my... My job is to uh, never ever judge the people I'm playing, decide whether they're good or bad, but to figure out <clears throat> what drives them and uh, what makes them, uh, what characteristics make up their sort of worldview. And um, I've sometimes played um, very, very characters who do very bad things but who are um, coming from a place where uh, you understand where it comes from. And for me, that's kind of like uh, really interesting to explore both sides of, of, of the darkness and the light in, within one entity. Um, I find those to be the most interesting characters to uh, hang out with. So let's go back to, uh, back to Sons of Anarchy. Being in a, a biker gang, as it may, and having to be the... It's the, not a gang, it's a, it's a motherfucker. <laughs> All right. It's a club. And if you brought your kids here, I'm fucking sorry. <laughs> being in a club. But she's clapping. <laughs> she's two and a half years old, she's saying, that guy, somebody fucking said it. Being in the club, being in the MC, and spending so many years actually in that, uh, was the family that was on set in the MC, how much of that do you feel was really like a family offset? Do you guys have the same kind of a relationship, in a good way, off the stage as you did on the stage? Yeah, when we first started out, we went, the first whole first year, <clears throat> maybe two years, we went everywhere together. We, we were just, we hung out. As much time offset as we did on set, we really, really formed a, a strong bond. We really enjoyed each other's company. Um, we really felt like we were thrown into this um, kind of um, uh, community uh, of extended family, N not really blood, but sometimes even more bonded than that. And we took to it uh, immediately. You know, the third, fourth, fifth, sixth season, everybody's starting to worry, like, he's making more money than me, and he's more famous than me. It got a little fucked up, but, you know, um, we really were uh, uh, very tight-knit through the whole thing. 
so you said it's not your job to judge the, the motivations of your characters, but in a situation like we just said with Sons of Anarchy, you get to see some uh, some of your fellow co-stars get uh, removed from the show in ways that may not have been uh, the most pleasant. Was there ever a time when it got to a point um, where one of your co-stars got the call and you're just like, man, I hate seeing that guy or that girl go out that way. That really sucks for that character that, that they had to go out in the way that they did. And you're like, oh, sucks to be you guys. I'm still around. Yeah, we, every one of us, from the time they killed Opie, we all knew nothing here is sacred. We can all go at, any, at the whim of Kurt Sutter at any minute of the time for a lot of reasons or for no reason at all, depending on you know how he wanted to fashion the, the arc of the story. So we were all on our guard for, um, like, when is, the, when is the guillotine coming down on me? Yeah, I'm glad that you bring up the, uh, the scene with Obi. That was, as a fan, probably the most emotional moment on television, not just for the for the season, but probably in all of television in that calendar year. The way that he went down, the way that that whole thing kind of stretched out. Um, for you guys in the cast, did you expect the kind of uh, viral reaction that happened in the crowd when, when Obi died? Yeah. You you knew you knew. Hey, this was really done in a way that was going to put him. He 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 suffered. Uh, his wife, the way she went down, the way he went down, just a brutal life. Yeah, we 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 knew that there was going to there was going to be cataclysmic because um, if you believe what everybody wants to lead you to believe that our show was based loosely on Hamlet um, and that Hamlet is the young prince and I'm Claudius who. who um, killed the king, was the brother of the king, killed the king and married the queen and became king. And then, you know, um, every one of us is, is going to meet Mr. Mayhem at some point. The only person in Hamlet that survives is Horatio, which is Hamlet's best friend, which was Opie. He was the first one to get whacked. So, fuck Hamlet, you know what I'm saying? Like, who, who's next, you know? Hey guys out there, so I just want to let you know real quick, so Ron is going to be actually leaving the building at like 4.45, so there's not going to be much time after this panel's done. If you've got a question that you want to ask him, you need to get up to this mic and do it now, because you're probably not going to get the opportunity afterwards. All right, Mr. Repo Man, you have heard the call. What is your name? What's your question? Joshu, I just had a quick question for you about uh, going back to Quest for Fire, if you have any good stories about that. What's up, do you have any good good stories about Quest for Fire? Um, do I have any good stories about Quest for Fire? Right. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Care to share. No, no. <laughs> Story as 
is fashioned by Guillermo del Toro, who did the first two, was meant to be three movies, a trilogy. And we never got around to the third one. And so um, I wouldn't just do any old Hellboy, but I would definitely do the third one of the trilogy with Guillermo if, if, he, ever, if he ever asked. Hey, come on, I'm trying to fucking talk over here. Yeah, what was that guy doing? <laughs> All right, thank you so much. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, next up, what is your name? What's your question? Hi, my name is Zan, and my question is, I'm a longtime fan, and I was wondering if you could share any of your memories from Beauty and the Beast. That's the first thing I saw you in. So, yeah, um, that was the very first um, mainstream moment I ever had in my career. I mean, uh, I had always been doing kind of very independent, kind of esoteric stuff on the fringes that, you know, aficionados would maybe find, but, but never if you tuned in to prime time on CBS, which is what <clears throat> Beauty and the Beast was my first kind of experience with that. So it meant a lot to me. And um, the fact that I was playing this Elizabethan character covered in, you know, really, really weird um, lionine slash um, quasi-human bestial makeup um, and reading, you know, um, John, John Dunn and, and William Wordsworth and Emily Dickinson in primetime on <laughs> Friday night at 8 o'clock was the perfect job because I had really trained to be that, to do that kind of acting work. You know, that's steeped in literature. But here I was in the most commercial, you know, place you could do it in. And so I knew that my time was limited. I knew that this thing couldn't last forever and I just enjoyed every single second of it while it lasted. And then of course, Linda Hamilton decided to um, get pregnant. <laughs> So we killed her off, and, uh, <laughs> and we, it, it ended uh, sooner than I even anticipated. It's hard to do Beauty and the Beast with only a beast. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> All right, next up, how you doing? Good, how about you guys? Uh, my name's Sam. Uh, I'm also a huge fan. Um, as a person who's really well known for doing, uh, you know, just, you know, Thing as yourself, obviously not as yourself, but you know what I mean, and as in uh, heavy prosthetics and things like that, do you prefer to do where you get to like inhabit a completely like inhuman character in prosthetics, or do you prefer to do it with just you so you can like just be out there like that? Which do you prefer, and do you have a pretty memorable experience of one or the other? Well, some of the more monstrous roles I've ever played were ones without makeup, um, so it's not a question of the type of person you're going to play, it's just the circumstances of, of what this person's physical condition is. Um, I found when I was a young man, um, well into my 40s in fact, I was really, really, this is going to be hard to believe because, you know, I seem so fucking, you know, together. Um, but I was really uncomfortable being me. And the fact that I could put this shield over my face, kind of like a, a barrier between myself and the world, and hide behind a mask, was just enough to free me up so that I could act freely. Um, without the, the makeup, I was very self-conscious. And I only learned to, how to like myself in my late 40s, early 50s. And that's when the makeup job started to diminish and I started to act more with this face. But the roles remain very kind of diverse. Some really, really extreme bad, bad people. Um, some very monstrous behavior, etc., etc. regardless of how much makeup there was. All right, cool. Thank you. Thanks a lot. All right, come on up next. Oh, somebody's got a velociraptor for an arm. <laughs> Hi, my name's Parker. My dad has shown me your movies. He will? My dad has shown me, shown me your movies. He has already? Yes. Okay. Two questions. How did you like your role in the Monster Hunter movie? And 
if they make a second one, will you be in it? I didn't like my hair. <laughs> Did you? <laughs> my sister's played the Monster Hunter. You can speak freely here. There's nobody listening. <laughs> Did you like my hair in the Monster Hunter movie? Come on, be honest. You did? Yeah. Oh, I thought it was really lame. Um, so I would come back and do a second one, but I'd like a different hairdresser. So you have another question? No. All right, thank you so much. Yeah, that, that's so the much. kind of showstopper, right? Sorry about that. All right, thanks. Another so unhappy customer. It's all good. It's all good. What's your name? What's your question? Uh, is I uh, heard that when you made the city of lost children that you did not speak French um, so, don't. <laughs> so what was it like trying to um, convey the emotion without understanding the language well when I did say my lines by the way my character is the biggest character in the movie so I'm in every single scene from beginning to end but they put all my dialogue, what I say in the movie, on one page. <laughs> so it seems as though I'm talking all the time, but I'm really not. So it was not hard to learn what I had to learn. But when I learned it, I knew what it meant. Right. They were looking for somebody who was like a fish out of water, like a, a, a country bumpkin. So because the movie takes place in France, they wanted somebody who was a foreigner. So they, all of the French actors that they met with just sounded too easy, too facile. And so they started look, expanding the search and, you know, they, 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 they needed to find somebody who, who spoke the shittiest French on earth. And they finally found me. You were the winner. Thank you, yeah. And, you know, yeah. and, and losing you sometimes win. Yeah. So that's, that's, every story has a moral. Thank you so much. All right, next up, what's your name, what's your question? Hi, I'm Michelle. Hi. Um, you are so versatile and have done so many things. Star Trek Nemesis and the Island of Dr. Moreau and you've just done so much with makeup work and special effects. With all of the things that you've done, which costume, shall we say, was the biggest pain in your ass that you never want to put on again because it was just so much work getting into and taking off that you're like, oh God, please don't ever cast me in that part again. Well, at the risk of once again shocking my, 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 body, my beautiful, devoted audience here, when you're wearing a tail, <laughs> which speaks through a very tight pair of leather pants. Understandable. and then a belt that has 500 weapons on it, don't ever get diarrhea. <laughs> because that emergency becomes, you can, you know, I don't, I don't want to paint too, too, with too broad a brush here. Thanks a lot, man. All right, what's your name? What's your question? 
Hello, my name is Justin. I'd like to thank, first of all, thank you for lending your iconic voice to much of my childhood, whether it be Slade or Lord Hood. I'd like to ask, which do you prefer doing, live acting roles or your voice acting roles? Um, I like acting. And the, the reason why I do it all, you know, I, I'll do a lot of voice work and I'll do a lot. I just like some people like doing crossword puzzles, you know, <laughs> like to, to occupy their mind or stimulate them. I like being given the challenge of, here's a piece of humanity on a page. It's just on a page. It doesn't exist. Make him exist. And that to me is like, you know, that's cool, kind of like, some people fuck with Rubik's Cubes, you know, like I, 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 I mess with humanity. And um, it comes in all forms performance-wise. Sometimes it's just voice work, sometimes it's live action. Um, occasionally it's porn, but um, <laughs> please don't judge me. You know, I have a couple of ex-wives and a family, and I have a lot of bills. But anyway, enough of me. How about you? What do you, what, what do you prefer? No, I, I do appreciate all your work in the voice roles such as Slade or, or the Lich King. I, I wouldn't I wouldn't tolerate this shit if I were you. I'd just all get up and leave. This is just <laughs> bullshit panel you're ever gonna look at. I think we're asking a good completely time. on serious Anyway, sorry, I'm, I'm I interrupted. I'd like to thank you, sir. Thank you. You have a good day. Hey, I got a quick question. Do you guys out there think this is a bullshit panel, or do you think this is an amazing panel? That's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about. All right. Next up, what's your name? What's your question for Mr. Hello. Um, my name is Alejandro. I got a quick question. Wait a minute. Weren't you up here? Oh, that was no, Alejandro. That, that, that was another. Uh, that was Alessandro. You're Alejandro. Alejandro. Yeah. We're off by one letter, at least. Yeah. Huge fan of your work, Sons of Anarchy. Uh, uh, some some people don't know you played also Clayface in Batman the Animated yes. Series. Um, with this recent passing of Kevin Conroy, uh, this this I think this year. Uh, what was your experience uh, working with him and working that series with that amazing character? I felt like you know uh, we are so blessed in the community, the people that we meet. Actors generally are big-hearted people, very generous, very kind. You know, they're, they're very empathetic to the human race. Usually you start acting because, you know, you, you, you're obsessed with, with covering up some pain or with getting your, your up right on screen or on stage, which you couldn't get right in real life. So you meet beautiful people. And Kevin Conway was one of the most kind, smiling beams of light that I've ever met. And we did the series together, but we stayed close because we lived in the same neighborhood in LA and I would see him, you know, many, many times every week. And we always, always had just wonderful, wonderful conversations and hugs. And, and uh, I was, I was uh, really, really, you know, that was a gut punch losing him as young as he was. Yeah, and we thank you for playing such a great um, role in that you know, series, which is, for me, in my opinion, the best animated series. <laughs> One more time, motherfucker. <laughs> thank you very much. Goddamn photo ops. <laughs> anyway, I'm sorry you had to hear that. What's up, Brad? My name is Mauro. How are you um, doing? Pretty good, man. How are you, man? Um, all right, so you, Hellboy, Vincent, and Clay walk into a bar. What are you all drinking? Uh, I don't know about the rest of those motherfuckers, but I'm drinking tequila. I got you. <laughs> um, Hellboy is probably drinking um, uh, you hoo <laughs> And eating a pizza. Uh, who else, Clay? Yeah, Clay and Vincent. Clay, Clay was uh, a whiskey man, Irish whiskey. Clay Morrow. Um, and uh, Vincent.
Vincent was too young to drink, even though he was an adult. <laughs> awesome. Thanks for your time. Next time I see you, I'll buy a tequila. Okay, man. Thank you, bro. I like the good stuff. Hey, how you doing? What you got for him? Doing well. My name's Sam. I got a question for you. That's a stupid question. And um, well, what's the best way to end an argument? Win an argument. What's the best way to win an argument? Yes, sir. Well, it depends on who you're having it with. If it's with your wife, it's like, God damn it, you're so right. <laughs> That's the only way to win. Yes, I agree. It took me a few marriages to figure that shit out. Well, I've been married once, 33 years. I never looked at it that way. You are so right. <laughs> never looked at it that way. You are so right. Uh, Thanks, sir. Appreciate it. Uh, my name is Paul. First off, we love you. Uh, my question is, uh, any fond memories of Ice Pirates? No. <laughs> no, actually, um, my co-star in that film was a lady named Angelica Houston. And her father was a huge idol of mine and everybody else who calls himself a cinephile. John Houston, the great John Houston. If you look at his filmography, it's mind blowing. And uh, Angelica and I were just like, we bonded and we became laughing buddies all through that movie. That's the thing that got me through it. I think that maybe got her through it as well, because we both knew we were making a piece of shit. And, uh, so yeah, you gotta get through it one way or the other. Keep it down over there, will you? <laughs> Thank you so much. What's your name? What's your name other than Spider-Man? Uh, Spider-Man. Uh, my name is Michael. Uh, it's a pleasure meeting you yesterday. You saw my Batman uh, Blu-ray uh, DVD set. I have a question. Um, you, you were in the very first live-action version of The Tick. I was curious what your experience was and, and if you enjoyed your character. Oh, I loved. I loved uh, Fiery Blade. Yes. 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 Yeah, because it, it was very short-lived. I loved uh, that show. Whether I was on it or not on it, I loved that show. Awesome. I, I loved Sorry, um, his name. Uh, Patrick Warburton? Yeah, Patrick Warburton was brilliant. The writing was phenomenal. The, the tone of the comedy was right up my alley. <clears throat> I had a great time. Cool, thank you. Well, hey, you man, what's your name? What's your question? Uh, my name's Daniel. Um, I know they already talked about Beauty and the Beast. That's the first thing I remember you from watching that with my mom on Friday nights. <laughs> Nobody's mentioned this movie that you were in. How arduous was it to get in shape? I know with a lot of military films, they actually put people through some type of basic training. So when you did Enemy at the Gates, how arduous was that training that you had to go through, or did they make you go through it? Um, it was not arduous at all, but very, very specific. Uh, the relationship that a sniper has with his rifle is something you can't take for granted. It's very specific. It's it's um, it's a, it's an art, and it requires complete and utter understanding of the weapon, and then the mastery of it. And um, so that's what we were, we were being inundated with in preparation for that. But I didn't have to do a lot of soldiery stuff and learn how to, you know. It was all very focused on the art of being a sniper. Thanks, sir. All right, next up, what's your name, what's your question? Hi, I'm Christopher, and I was wondering which one of your villains would beat all the rest of the villains, and why are you so good at being a villain? <laughs> I mean, I don't have to answer the second part of that, <laughs> um, Which one would beat all the others? Which? Um, I think all my villains were Beatable. I think that's what I loved about them, was that they were weak, essentially. And that's what fascinated me about um, exploring somebody who seems to be the most aggressive thing you could possibly come in contact with. But what it is he's covering up for is a weakness. Um, you'll find that in most bullies and most uh, villains. You know, you look around, I don't want to get political, I'm in Florida, but... Uh, I'm not even going to answer.
I'm not even going to finish that sentence. Thank you very much. Unless you all finish it for me. If you follow my Twitter, you know what the fuck I mean. Blade 2 was awesome. Thank you so much. I've watched it so many times. You carried that thing, man. Thank you. All right. How you doing, my man? What's your name? What's your question? Uh, my name is John, and you worked with uh, Jean-Pierre Junet on both City of Lost Children and Alien Resurrection. And in one of those movies, you got to speak English. And I was just wondering if you had any anecdotes or could describe how the second movie you worked with on it was with him, or and just tell us a little bit about your experience at all. Well, it was interesting because I didn't speak any French, and he didn't speak any English when we did City of Lost Children. And then he got invited to do um, Alien Resurrection and knew that he had to learn English. Um, I don't really have anything interesting to add to that, but that's basically what happened. But um, it, was, um, it, was, it was interesting to see him in both of those kind of iterations. Thank you. And I just wanted to let you know, my dad's not here because he's too sick to be here, but your, uh, Hel your performance in Hellboy is one of his uh, favorite things in any movie. I hope he gets well. Hey, what's your dad's name, Matt? What's your dad's name? Alan. Alan, let's give a shout out to Alan. Give a hand clap for Alan. All right, next up, what's the name? What's the question? Uh, my name is Austin, and uh, I just wanted to know, what was your favorite part about filming Sons of Anarchy? The cigars. <laughs> they were free, by the way. How you doing, man? What's the name? What's the question? My name's Eric. Hi, Ron. Um, my question, basically, uh, I'm running out of shit to watch, and I'm just kind of wondering, I'm, I've become a new fan of yours, and uh, you've done a lot of things. What are you most proud of? Because I'm going to watch it tonight. Um, there's a movie called Asher. Which I produced and starred in, and um, because I produced it, because I found it, um, and uh, the writer had never been produced before, so it was a very hard movie to get financed, and we ended up getting it made. Um, no one saw it, but I think you can find it on Amazon Prime if you type in Asher. And that movie turned out um, pretty close to how I imagine it should, which is, you can't always say that, so I'm really proud of that one. Awesome. Watching it tonight. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. All right. All right. What's your name? What's your question? Hi, I'm Frank, and I wanted to know, was there any advice that you still use today from your high school drama teacher? Um, make sure your shoes are tied. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to trip and fall and break your nose. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. All right, next up, and so for right now, after this question, we're gonna cut the audience questions uh, to make sure we keep this in the, uh, you're gonna still be up there, no, no, I'm definitely not cutting you off, that'd be really great. Uh, yeah, you're gonna ask your question, but we're gonna cut the audience questions to make sure we can keep it on the right time so Ron can get back to his table and you guys can go back there and get some swag from him before he has to get out the door. All right, so coming up to the mic, what's your name, what's your question? No pressure. Um, hi, my name is Kristen, um, just on a quick question. Um, Is figuring out how he's going to go back. I think they're playing the bingo across the hall. Bingo? I didn't hear you. That's why I stopped you. Okay. I appreciate that. Thank you. I was just curious how you met Del Toro since you've been working together with him for over 30 years and how you've maintained that working relationship for so Who? long. Del Toro. Oh, Guillermo. Yeah. He invited me to be in his first movie. He'd never made a movie before in Mexico City. It was 1991. Mm -hmm. It was called Kronos. I love Kronos. And, um, I was there for, you know, his coming out party, and I was one of the first ones to realize I'm in the presence of somebody who, in a, you know, if there's any, any, you know, uh, justice in this world, this guy's going to leave behind an amazing body of work, and uh, we became beyond friends, like like brothers, and. Um, we just wanted to be kind of part of each other's progress ever since. Um, he's a delightful guy to be around. He's very funny. He's, he's, you know, first one to tell you Mexicans take nothing seriously. 
which I love about him. And, and you know, as you can probably tell, after 15 minutes, I don't either. Um, and so, um, and then he has this unbelievable ability to create stories and characters, all of which you want to be a part of if you're an artist. And I've been lucky that he's brought me along with him. Just, I just wanted to thank you for just having that relationship and just sharing your work with the world. It's very, very, very lucky. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. All right, so I've got a couple cool questions for you before I wrap this up. So, the makeup for Hellboy, surely it took, the costume it probably took hours and hours to put on, but one time you put it on for Make-A-Wish. Hours and hours to do that. Let's talk about why you would go through such an arduous costuming session so that you could uh, fulfill a Make-A-Wish. To see the look on the kid's face. Is that something uh, you would you would do often if somebody was asked even today, like, hey, I'd love to see Ron Ron Perlman be my Hellboy from the Make a Wish. Would you go ahead and do it again tomorrow? Absolutely. Excellent. The the uh, the, the, the story is uh, Mike Elizaldi, who was part of the makeup team on Blade 2 and then on Hellboy 1 and 2 and actually applied my makeup on Hellboy 2. He got a call from the Make-A-Wish Foundation saying that there's a kid who wants to meet Hellboy. And I said, sure, when and where? He says, before I answer that, he doesn't want to meet Ron. He wants to meet Hellboy. I said, well, how do you feel about that? He says, I'm down. I said, because you're going to be the one doing all the work. I sit there in the chair and you put the fucking shit all over me and then I, you know, I have my picture taken. So we all uh, agreed that it was something we wanted to do, and it turned into one of the most beautiful days of my life. It's when you realize how lucky you are when you can put a smile on a kid's face. That's good stuff. All right, so last but not least, in the, in the public eye, your career started with Beauty and the Beast. In the public eye. And you're portraying an animal, portraying that kind of creation. Now you're going on the other side of things in a huge franchise. You're going to be the voice of Optimus Primal in the upcoming movie. Um, what did you think about being able to uh, voice this character that's in an iconic franchise? And do you think that you've uh, helped to make him better than he's ever been before? Was if I just watched the premiere of uh, the new Transformers this Monday night, and it was the first Transformers movie I've ever seen. So I don't, I don't have anything to go on as to whether it was better or worse. Um, but it was, um, you know, it's just, it's like everything else. I mean, my thing is, is I can't think of, of fame and fortune and the result it's going to have on the world. I can only think of like. Do I understand this character well enough to play him? And can I play him well enough so that I can entertain the audience? If the answer to that is no, I say no. If the answer to that is yes, I go do it. And, and then that's, that's the end of my expectations. I don't, I don't want to know how much money it made. I don't want to know what, what the reviews were like. I just come here and I hang out with people like you guys. And, and uh, you know, and I, that's how I get to find out if it reached anybody, you know? All right, that's great stuff. All right, so Ron is going to be out of the building in about an hour. So if you guys have uh, any quick things you want to go back to his booth and uh, yeah, get a picture, anything like that, I'm going to go get it right now because you're not going to have the opportunity to come 4.46 p.m. All right, so let's give it one more last huge.